Welcome, everybody. Delighted to have you all here um, at this really, I hope it's going to be a very fascinating, interesting window into how you use technology to create a better world. And we're going to focus on mass financial inclusion and mass inclusion more generally. And we have uh, a, a superb panel of experienced people who have used technology to make a difference uh, to ordinary people all around the world. I'm going to kick off, though, uh, with a brief introduction. I'm Katan Patel. I'm the chairman of Force for Good, um, also an executive member of the World Academy of Art and Science. And the day job is to run an investment firm uh, where we invest in private equity in early to mid-stage businesses in the growth phase. So we, we have the experience of every day sitting down and seeing people pitch to us um, great technologies that they think will change the world. And one of the most exciting things I get to do is um, to travel the world, sit down somewhere, and end up seeing 20 to 50 people who are pitching something they think will make a big difference. And so um, today you'll see some of them, and uh, all three of these are people that we know very well as a firm, but also people that we've uh, invested in too. At least two out of three we made an investment in. Hopefully that will get to three out of three at some stage. Um, the theme, as you know, of CS is human security for all. And it's a, it's a critical theme, especially in these times, where as a result of the pandemic and the war in Europe and long-standing issues, uh, the world might not actually achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which, if you're not familiar, are a series of targets set in 2015, agreed by the whole world. And you can imagine how difficult that must have been to get an alignment amongst all the nations of the world to agree that we will reduce poverty and reduce hunger, uh, reduce the inequalities across the planet, and see if we can create a better world where everyone is a participant. And um, those goals um, are tough to achieve, as you can imagine. But in, here we are in this year in a position where we are seven years away from the target of 2030. And it seems as if the goals are much further away than we imagined. Uh, and technology, based on a study that we've done recently, might be the biggest change um, to achieving those goals. We believe that the goals can be achieved. At least 40% of the gap can be closed. And something like $55 trillion can be saved just by the execution of technologies. And so um, this, this whole CS event and the role that you all play in technology uh, is an important factor in achieving what should be the leveling up of the world. Um, I'll begin with a, with a small uh, case study, actually, a short story of how one of the countries that we work with um, has actually made a big difference using technology for mass financial inclusion. And that country is India. India, as you know, is, uh, is a country of nearly 1.4 billion people. Um, it managed to achieve, achieve something as a democracy that must be nearly impossible to do as a democracy. It introduced an ID system eight years ago and linked a piece of financial technology, fintech if you like, to that ID system. And as a result of that, um, in eight years, they have nearly 477 million people opened a bank account. Um, now, we all live in, in places all over the world where it's relatively easy to open a bank account. You just need the ability to fill a form in. But imagine how difficult that is if you cannot complete that form, if you don't have a fixed abode, and so this piece of technology is revolutionary because the ID automatically opens a bank account. What they also did was not just the bank account, you get a debit card, you get a, an accident insurance policy, you get a, the ability to have an unsecured loan. Um, and these features have meant that there is financial inclusion for the first time. And the ecosystem that grew up around uh, a country doing something like that is enormous. The whole financial services industry had to change. The cost structure of that industry had to change so they could serve the poor. Um, fintech industries have grown up all over the country uh, to serve people through the mobile phone. And so nearly half a billion people have, have had this opportunity. The Indian government would like to offer that to the rest of the world uh, for free. And so um, this uh, very advanced piece of technology that allows financial inclusion hopefully will roll out across the rest of the world, particularly across the south of the world that has the biggest needs. 
and we will see that mass inclusion. Um, our panelists today are experts in actually exploiting technologies like that to create inclusion of various types. Um, if, I, if I start on my left here, we have Johnny Mathute. Uh, the Mathute family have been in, finance, in the finance business in India for 135 years, I believe. Johnny Mathute is, uh, is a successor to now what is a broad-based financial group that banks the unbanked, uh, the people who cannot manage to get into the financial system. And um, he's the chairman of the group uh, and also of uh, Mathute um, FinCorp. Let me introduce um, Char um, uh, Shelley too, Shelley Kajaria. Shelley, delighted to have you here with us too. Um, She's flown all the way from Calcutta and uh, literally arrived at midnight. Um, Shelley's a, a serial entrepreneur and runs a business called Tesseract, which also has figured out ways to include people who do not have inclusion. Um, and we have uh, Anil Matthews on the end there. Anil Matthews is also a serial entrepreneur and is the founder and CEO of a company called Near. Near is uh, an intelligence, an advanced intelligence business. Let me kick off with the first question. And... Um, I'll, um, I'll pose it to you. Um, what changes have you seen as a result of this uh, endeavor by the Indian government to roll out financial inclusion? How has it affected ordinary people? Financial inclusion for the Indian government has been always a, a major focus point in the last eight years, what we have seen from 2014, the, the focus has been more to do with how technology can be brought in for financial inclusion. And that, that is where the first uh, milestone we have reached on opening around 500, 500 million accounts for the citizens uh, who were unbanked so far. The, the, with the opening of the bank accounts, we have also linked the, the unique identity which was given as a 12-digit number, which is known as Aadhaar, and also the mobile. So th this is known as the first trinity, that is, in short, is known as JAM because the, uh, the scheme under which the accounts were opened was known as Then, which is Honorable Prime Minister's uh, program to ensure that accounts are opened for every citizen. Linking that with the Aadhaar, which is the unique ID which is, uh, uh, which is given to all citizens, the penetration has been 100% for every adult. And linking it again with the mobile. So that is the first trinity. Now the second revolution that is happening is on, on bringing a unified payment system which is known as the UPI and also the uh, EKYC because you need to have uh, the your identity plus your uh, information as a customer and the third linking uh, is happening on the account aggregator which is the entity provides all the inf financial information of a customer to to a user for example a bank or a non-bank they need information this is available from the uh, aggregator account aggregator so the second trinity is the UPI, EKYC, and the account aggregator. All these are steps towards creating a digital public uh, infrastructure, DPI. So it ensures identity of customers, it ensures payment systems for customers, and also a consent-based information is available of customers. So the, all these have been efforts taken by the government to bring in financial inclusion and technology is re really accelerating these. And this is where 
the the government of india puts in lot of focus for bringing financial inclusion thank you thank you johnny um shalia let me let me ask you to answer the same question what what are the changes you're seeing yeah so india's done a bunch of things in technology like he mentioned a lot of data stacks a uh, lot of access to technology which makes data more formal but financial inclusion so yes a half a billion people have been included in the finance system but what has changed the behavior of people have changed so i come from a very small town where where i used to go we used to pay by cash and that was the norm but now even if you're buying a chocolate you pay by upi which is digital payments so every payment that you do is now digital which means that when we start i do msme lending when we were doing msme lending 5 years back our algorithm used to see asymmetry of data that was our main unique uh, proposition which means people were not reporting so if i make 100 rupees i report only 50 rupees and that's why there was asymmetry and that was the whole lending game that how do you find out how much money he actually makes but because of all this digitization and bank accounts and financial inclusion what has happened is people are now actually reporting their real incomes because they're incentivized to do so because if you report you get better civil score i mean better credit rating you get better credit rating you get better access to loans and then you can grow your business so how government's efforts is actually changing behavior of people is very interesting and when people's behaviors change and they become more uh, responsible about paying taxes they become more ethical about borrowing because now if you don't you're going to get reported to credit bureau that just changes the entire ethos of the country and that you can see in the growth rate so it's more it's much beyond technology it's about changing people's behavior thanks shelly you've when i first met anil um he was uh, a young poor man with big ambitions now you created the first business you moved to singapore you created another business you moved to la i believe now too right and you have a business in silicon valley what are the shifts you've seen back in india and how do you see that how do they compare to what you see here in terms of payment systems and how people behave thanks kiran very valid point i think i would say the biggest change that i have seen is if just few years back you know let's say pre pandemic year when i was in, i'm in india you need to carry a bunch of cash because for all physical payments that you need to do in stores with vendors and then you need to have a bunch of logins to log into your different banking systems to do all digital payments i mean you know this is this accelerated during the pandemic the the usage of unified payments but what's happened today is these two offline and online transactions are merged and there's no need of that anymore today i don't need to carry cash i'm actually not carrying cash at all when i'm in india whether it is the smallest payment to few cents or to you know a $1000 i could just do it in upi that seamlessness i haven't seen in any country and i can tell you that we are a global company we travel a lot you would have seen yourself It's, it's this is not possible in the country and that I, i i don't think i have that flexibility even here in la where i i need to completely can be cashless um this is i think the biggest change that i have seen this also means that there is it was one thing that you know the system is very secure but but eventually i think people realize it's also very reliable i can rely on it. it's real time i can pay someone a vendor or or for a service uh, for the maid i can pay for you know i can pay for buying a tv but it's instant it's reliable but most importantly it's interoperable and that was i think the game changer being interoperable um this was connecting both in my mind the digital world and the physical world and i think i could relate that to the business that we run Why don't you talk a little bit about that? What what is unique about your business? Would you describe it a little bit? What it does? Absolutely. So what we do at Near is we are looking at massive data points, billions of data points on a daily basis, to understand consumer behavior, both in the physical world and the digital world. Which means 
we are actually processing huge amounts of data, cleaning that up, looking at the, the, uh, you know, so the source of truth in understanding people's consumer uh, movement, people, human movement, what we call it, consumer behavior, and then merging them to bring in insights and analytics that we can then take to enterprises and brands, and tell them, hey, the consumer behavior, especially during pandemic or any, you know, even if you look at now what's happening with the, the economy, consumer behavior has changed drastically. Your understanding of consumer behavior has gone to a toss. Now, the only way you can rely on understanding this is using data. And that's where we, where we come into picture, where we are bringing in this data to help enterprises and brands understand this consumer behavior better. And I think the similarity, like I was mentioning to you, what we see here is between the physical and the digital world, how we can merge these two worlds. Because what you were doing prior to um, you know, UPI, like I mentioned in India, the physical world is completely different in the digital world. I think um, what we also seen, for example, is once you understand this a little bit more deeper, we can actually use it for various use cases. We have worked with s different countries in Asia Pacific where we have given our data, the human mobility data during pandemic to understand which counties do you bring in um, more controls of, of uh, people's movement? Where do you open the next vaccination sites? and so on. So this was a, a big use of understanding consumer behavior, consumer movement in a, in, at large scale in a, in a more privacy safe, aggregated way. So some of the issues that people face on data security and personal security, yeah. identity information, yeah. you somehow have the algorithms that protect people but you still track behaviors. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think. The core of our business is also um, a, a different kind of unified ID that we have. So we have a unified ID. So in our system, there's 1.6 billion monthly active users across around 44 countries. Now, we assign a unique ID to each of them behind the scene. This unique ID is, again, interoperable between both the worlds, the physical world and the digital world. And the way this works, this helps us especially if you look at a brand, uh, the challenge they were facing is your digital footprints that you're living, you know, the breadcrumbs that we call it when you move from one website to another or one app to another was very well understood. But the physical footprints on which restaurants you're going and, you know, which um, uh, beaches you visit or, you know, sort of all this behavior was disconnected. But imagine if you're able to connect these two and if you're able to understand this at a deeper level, it would allow brands and enterprises that, that is um, to, to help consumers, to reach out to them and work more, more closely with them, providing um, better services, better offerings, and will reduce fraud because then there is a lot of things was, un, was not derived out of this data. So with this data, now you can reduce fraud, you can have more transparency, and understand deeper uh, behavior of consumers providing better services. And that's what actually we have seen. Thank you, Anil. Shelley, I'm going to ask you, um, what does your business do that is special? And how does it touch people and make a difference to, to people using your technology and your business? So we at Tesseract do MSME lending. MSME is small, medium businesses. So in India, there are uh, 100 million MSMEs, and that's actually one of the cornerstones of the economy. You have MSMEs from uh, people who just have cattle, like cows and sheep, that's also an MSME, to companies which are listed. So it's a diverse range with some where there is no data available how to underwrite them, and then there is tons of data available. Now, the problem statement we had was, how do you underwrite these people and uh, still give them a good user experience? Because in India, it takes, it, not only in India, I think globally we've seen MSME lending people take 30 days or 15 days to give these people loans. So in absence of formal data, how do you still give user experience and control risk? 
risk tech is what we specialize in because we're not in the business of selling iPhones. Yes, definitely, user experience matters. But what also matters is that you need to lend and collect the money back. So what we did differently is, uh, in India for MSME lending, and even globally, you will see that people go through brokers, intermediaries, and those intermediaries will are not interested in uh, giving you the right debt stack. So if you're a MSME, small, let's say a restaurant, you should ideally be having a business loan and a secured loan. Or if you're an exporter, you should be having an export loan. But that's not what they're interested in. The brokers are interested in their commission. So they lend irresponsibly. They will make you get loans, which makes them the highest commission. And this is what happens for 90% of the country. So we took this idea of all large Companies have investment bankers guiding them, seeing their data and guiding them what is the ideal debt stack for you. But for millions of these MSMEs, that's not possible. So we took data, limited data, made behavioral science become more important than just numbers. So we saw banking statements and saw that whether you're a restaurant or you are a small uh, mom and pop shop, you tend to behave the same from your banking patterns. And by just seeing behavioral signs, you can predict probability of default. So with limited data, we started segmenting MSMEs. And now we offer them multiple loan products, which is an ideal debt stack for you. Not, so it's almost like a personalized stylist who tells you what will look good on you in terms of clothes. We have personalized debt advisors who tell you what the right stack is. And then to make that money available at cheap cost of funds, we work with a lot of PSU, which is public sector banks, which have large capital access, but they don't have the technological means to uh, pass that money in the right format to these MSMEs. So get capital from large PSU banks and make it reach to the MSMEs in a very personalized, responsible way is what we do at Tesseract. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, you, um, you deal with the unbanked. Tell us about that. How does that work? So uh, at, at Muthut, uh, what we do uh, is uh, bringing the, the, the customers who are at the bottom of the pyramid, the low-income households, and uh, customers who have some kind of business a family uh, business which is of uh, of a very small nano scale these customers need working capital so we provide uh, savings products we provide uh, money transfer facility provide uh, small credit home loans so uh, all the financial services that we provide is for the low income or the low income households. It starts from uh, a $200 to maybe a $5,000. But we use a lot of technology at the back end and the front end to cater to these customers. We uh, sometimes we give loans maybe in 10 minutes. It's only possible with technology. We give uh, loans in 48 hours for a home loan, uh, which is again for the se these segment of customers. What enables us to give these kind of service delivery is only because of the technology we use. And all these are done through physical contact. This is very unique. We have around 30,000 Muthutians, and we have around 4,200 uh, brick and mortar offices. You may wonder with technology, why do you need all these people and offices? Yeah, explain that because you know so, we've just heard fintech and what it does. So, so here, when you when you bring these kind of uh, small uh, borrowers or the the bottom of the pyramid customers. They need to be handhold. They have to be. There have to be a relationship uh, built between 
the the uh, entity who is providing the services and uh, this is how we bring these customers into the fold and once they are here then we use all the best technology to give them the service and also the uh, how best we can use the physical contact and the data which we generate from these customers all of us sitting here today can do end to end uh, digital financial transactions but the, the same transaction on a assisted model is what we do for our segment of customers the data is almost the same uh, what we generate and also the customers which we uh, through physical contact get the the data is almost the same how best we can use this data to improve uh, and to create more unmet products for these customers uh, the uh, key thing here and uh, we cater to almost 100000 customers on a daily basis and these are all customers we have a kind of a physical contact and this is almost across india so i i I'd, i'd make an important point here which is you know um in a country of 1.4 billion people you heard the msme sector which is the really small businesses really um is is broad it's 100 million people i mean that's um that's that's a big country really but that's just one sub segment and i think both of you are helping people who have no ability to participate participate in the system itself and delivering the most basic of security and i think the impression uh, of the world has been security is about military weapons that can be used to give security to a nation but the whole theme of human security for all is that human security is something very basic to all of us and our needs and i think uh, both of you are talking about that and i'd like to pick you up a little bit talk about that too because um you sound and talk like a tech entrepreneur who is using technology and data to deliver services that are very sophisticated um during the pandemic you had to think about how you apply that data and how you help with the fact that um you have critical pieces of information that can help save lives can you talk a little bit about that yeah sure the you know the challenge today is when you look at consumer behavior um if you walk into a store in many There's a, there's a high chance that the store has sensors they have any way collect data you know based on your purchase behavior they have you know um CRM data to understand this right that when you walk out of the door or out of the store they lose you as a consumer their understanding of you as a consumer goes away and so they they have no idea what you did after that this is very similar to when you walk out of a website or an app where you know you get disconnected so it's just, it's very similar in both the physical and the digital world now what we are trying to do with technology is help these help them understand this journey when you walk out of the door do you go to a competition did you um how many times you would you go to a competition versus coming to the store and where is your catchment area where where which zip code probably would you live in and and so on with technology today you can understand and and complete this consumer journey and actually address as during this journey where you know what can be how we can we help them in each each phases of their of their journey and i think that is um, that is not possible if you're not connected very well and and not able to sort of use data Uh, at at a very granular level but the, the challenge is also that data today has a lot of noise so the data that you would have access to would not tell you the entire truth if you're not cleaning up that noise deduplicating it at large scale and constantly analyzing this using advanced science and uh, and and machine learning that is required and, and so it requires a different kind of expertise And which is what we were very interested in that data during the pandemic from you right yes i think so so the pandemic because what happened like i said it it almost it, it was almost like a train came to an halt right so uh, it, it, the, the understanding that you had about people going out eating shopping you know buying things that all all of a sudden came to a stop 
Now, this meant like a different change in behavior. Now, what we're doing was primarily mostly on digital devices and then interacting with, with brands and interacting with enterprises differently. So that understanding you know, was something that was we needed to stitch back in, relearn everything, and then look at consumer journey differently. Um, Shelley, can I ask you a question about um, the impact that you think you make you, know, you, you participate in the physical world, but you're also in the digital world, and you're making an impact on people's lives. What, what is that impact? How does it give them security? So we do about 80, 90% of our lending digitally, which means that we don't need to meet the customer. You can sit out of Bombay and lend across India, right? So that's, that's the power of digital. But still, uh, there is a physical element to it, so we came up with this, uh, India is now launching facial recognition as well. So we have this uh, very forward looking uh, project where it's, it's a joke at this point that you know, blink once if you want a loan and close your eyes if you don't want a loan, which is basically we'll take your face, link it to Aadhaar, get your KYC, and from there get the bureau data and everything, like it just is a domino effect. So it's literally, we'll just take a picture and then you know, you're know you done. That's a very forward-looking project, but a, a subset of it was some automation that we did on KYC. And we, we did this brilliant tech stack and then we launched it with our sales team. And we told them, now you don't need to collect XYZ from the customer, it's super seamless, how would this be? And their first reaction was that the customer will think this is a fraud. It wasn't that the customer journey is so brilliant. It was like, it's too easy. Customer will think it's a fraud. So there is this physical, unfortunately, there's this, still this physical layer of trust which is required. So we have customers who complete the entire journey digitally and then walk into our office just to make sure that we are legitimate. So now we actually have video conference room just to show them. So in India, uh, there is still this physical element for trust and the government has done a lot of things to ensure that this fraud which has happened, uh, there is a lot of data security and actions taken to eliminate fraud. So uh, that was on the physical and digital, but the impact that we make, yes, I, I think MSME lending, if we are able to reach out to the 100 million, we, we just expect to convert 1 million. Okay, at the back of 1 million MSME customers, you can build a $10 billion enterprise and lending, and that's impacting a lot of lives and uh, the economy, so. Very interesting, thank you. Johnny, what is the impact your business makes? Uh, and you, you forgot to say something. Who are your customers? The women, right? Uh, we have around 70% of our customers women. And all these women have got some kind of a economic activity and the, the most of these loans, microcredit we give is, is based on cash flow. And uh, the, the, the amount is determined by the, uh, is matched to their cash flow. Uh, coming to... Why, why are so many of them women? Uh, I think that's worth knowing. So, but most of these women are new to some kind of activity, and uh, when when the men are into some something else, the women has got their own way of earning, and most of these women have got uh, something which they do from their home. It's not that they have a, uh, a enterprise which they have to run with employees. It's maybe. A, a kind of a activity which they can do on their own, but still they earn something, and this is how real financial inclusion happens and the progress happens in the family. And, and the credit worthiness of the woman has turned out to be higher than the credit worthiness of the men you found, right? So in the first instance, there will not be any credit uh, 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 score available or a credit rating that we can uh, take on these uh, women. But once they start borrowing, uh, and when they have completed few cycles, there is a pattern that is created out of their uh, 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 repayment, 
and based on that a score is determined within the organization and also the external bureau uh, determines a score on this and most of these customers if things go well uh, are are able to repay because they do some activity very uh, efficiently and they are able to uh, uh, earn an income out of which the, and what we are seeing an impact is that each year or within two years the next cycle they would need more money so that th their business has also grown uh, during this time i don't want i don't want people to think that you're running a charity uh, how big is your business in terms of revenue in terms of profitability so uh, we, uh, all our entities are for profit and uh, all all the the entities today uh, are earning enough revenue to make profit uh, uh, year to year uh, in the in the uh, the total turnover for last year for our disbursement was almost 5 5.6 billion uh, US dollars was our total disbursement last year and uh, these disbursements happen uh, every day so uh, and the, these disbursements happen through our uh, branches and today most of these disbursements we would want the customers to take it digitally i think this is an important point there is an assumption that serving the poor is unprofitable and i think um, what we found here in all three cases in terms of tracking people understanding their behaviors and serving them is an enormously profitable business um, I think you're a couple of years ahead of plan, and perhaps we'll leave an IPO pretty soon, yeah, right? Yeah, next year is what we're planning. Okay. Let, me, uh, let me ask Shelley the same question. Shelley, um, if I take it to the final round, we're in the last few minutes, um, what is the positive thing that you think, uh, from your experience, we can do to the world to drive this inclusion further? I think uh, innovation should be 100x not like 1x, 2x. So don't make like a car bec the increase the mileage from 10 to 15, but like make a completely new electric car. And I think that's, that's the spirit of this entire event, right? 100x innovation. So I think if we back the right set of metrics, which means not vanity metrics, as you said, profitability, genuine, meaningful innovation, not just acquiring customers and uh, uh, for the heck of it. So if we back, if the investors back and ask the right questions, they back the right set of entrepreneurs, then each of this entrepreneur will do a 100x innovation. And that's the best way to have hundreds of smart entrepreneurs doing 100x innovation to make the world a better place. I like that. Anil? Yeah, I think uh, a very question. valid point, actually. Um, uh, like my uh, you know, peer said here, Completely agree with her, but I think from my point of view, the way I look at it is being a tech entrepreneur, um, technology can play a very key role in every aspect, whether it is um, you know, just a, a business to business interaction or a business to consumer interaction. Um, today, what we are seeing is a lot of data that was out there, a lot of uh, information that was out there wasn't accurate for the lack of technology. And even with technology, it wasn't used the right way. You, you, you need to think of technology as a weapon. It can be used for the good, but also for not so good. And I, I'm a strong believer that with the right um, regulations in place, with the right tools and right um, use of technology, the world can definitely become a, a lot better place. When we talk about financial inclusion and when we bring the informal to the formal. It's, it's a journey which we are starting. The, both the, the provider and the customer, we are starting a journey. And it's not just a transaction that we do with these customers, it's a transformation. So the, each of these customers are taken, uh, transformed from one stage to the next stage to the next stage. So the, when they came in, they were an informal customer, now that we have made them a formal customer. We have given them, given them enough of the financial services that 
would enable them to progress in life. That is again a transformation. They have understood what is financial literacy. Today, when we talk about digital for them, they have understood what is a digital. It's again another transformation. The next transformation is to look at their overall well-being. Today, we are talking about health. We are talking about uh, 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 how we can make security, uh, financial security, and health security for them. Thank you very much. We're in the last step, and let me just sum it up to say that um, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, we might have looked at the poor and thought they're not customers, they're not participants, and there's nothing we can do. But technology has managed to transfer half a billion people in one country from poverty into inclusion. And these are very profitable customers. As an investor in some of these businesses, we expect to, to make three to 10 times our money. It's, it's that kind, that's the sort of aspiration that you would have. Um, because these are very, it's very profitable to change people's lives for good and in that process, follow that journey with a company that does that. And so one of the messages I would have for you is the human security challenge, and the headline numbers are so depressing. There's 100 million people thrown into extreme poverty. There are 100 million kids who, who have not been educated to basic literacy levels. Um, these, are, these are things that we look at, and charity cannot solve. But technology with finance, or the returns that people expect to get for their savings can actually transform that situation. And so it's a, it's a very practical thing that we've talked about with this group. And so with that in mind, let me thank you very much for your time and attention. Wish you well.